So kind to me. Oh. 
morning, everyone. How are we doing this morning? All right. Yeah, we're, we're, we're getting there. We're getting there. You know, I will give you a pass. I know it's raining, and it's kind of a damper on the, the, the spirit of spring. But hey, good morning. I'm glad that you're here. My name is Daniel. I'm one of the pastors here on staff, and I want to welcome you. If you are new here to Grace, we want to ensure that you get plugged in, and we want to get to know you a little bit. There's some connection cards on the backs of the seats. Fill one of those out and drop it over at our guest services. We have a free gift for you. And again, it's just an opportunity to ensure that we get to know you and we get you plugged in here to welcome you into the Grace family. Uh, beyond that, this summer, we are excited. We're going to be doing what's called our Kids Summer Fest. Now, in years past, this has been known as our sports camp, but we are going bigger and better than ever in our, our desire to disciple the next generation, and so we're calling this our Grace Kids Summer Fest. Now, we're expecting more kids than ever, and we're expecting an opportunity to disciple them deeper than we've ever gone before, and so we want to encourage you, if you're interested in serving or participating in in our Kids Summerfest, we need your help. We're going to need a lot of volunteers this year. In fact, we're, we're aiming to have over 60 volunteers, far more than we've ever had. And so if you want to participate in this, please sign up. You can do so by going to gracechico.org forward slash events on our normal events page. You can sign up there where the kids sign up. There's a section for volunteers. Be sure to do that. And maybe you have questions, that's okay too. Find me in the Kids Center lobby after service and I would love to chat with you. Now on that note, we have an awesome message for you today, but before we do that, we got awesome worship. So stand up on your feet and let's worship together. Good morning, family. My name is Lisa and Brad and over 100 of our guys are at man camp this weekend. Yeah. So we get to be with you and worship our amazing God. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. Let's sing about that promise.
So I used to listen to the radio when I'm driving in my car. And every once in a while, God just puts a song on there that just meets me where I am. And I marinate in it, in it for a while. And the latest one is this one that we're going to introduce today. It's called Made for More. And the part of it that really got me, the phrasing, was we are not meant to be tending this grave. And, <clears throat> sorry, um, tending means to care for or cultivate something. And in 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, Therefore, if any man believes in God, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are new. And yet many times we will sit in our guilt and our shame and our failure. And family, there's nothing there. <laughs> we are bought. We are new. We are new creatures grave is empty. And so that's what this next song is about. We are made for more.
Go ahead and grab a seat for me for just a moment. Today, uh, we're going to participate in communion together. And this is an opportunity to reflect on the goodness of God. And we, we learned from that first song, we heard in that first song, that he loved us so much that he gave his one and only son for us. His body was broken and his blood was spilled for the forgiveness of all people, for everyone. So regardless of what your past look like, looks like or what your future might look like, those sins have been forgiven. And last week, we had 67 people publicly proclaim that as truth <laughs> through baptism. 67. And so today, as a church, as the body of Christ, we get to participate in communion together where we get to celebrate that and reflect on that free gift of salvation, a gift that is undeserved. There's nothing that we can do to earn that right, but really all it is is an acceptance of Jesus as Lord and Savior, that we understand that he is fully God and fully man and our sins are forgiven. So around the room, there are a few tables around the space, both in the back and up front on the sides. I'll, I want to encourage you, as you come up to gather those elements, the little uh, piece of bread and a little cup of juice, to reflect on that gift, to reflect on how your sins have been forgiven and what you are to do with the rest of your life as you pursue him with every ounce of your being. So go ahead and take some time to grab those elements and hold on to them as we do communion together. These elements, although they are just a cup of juice and a little piece of bread, they do represent the body of Christ that was broken for each and every one of us and the blood that was spilled. And at the Last Supper, uh, Matthew 26, uh, verses 26 through 28 says this, uh, just as they were about to gather, Jesus says, now as they were eating, Jesus took the bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Go ahead and eat now. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink 
of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Go ahead and drink now. Now, as we continue in worship, I want to encourage you, for those of you who have accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, you know what that feeling is, that free gift of salvation. And I want to encourage you to praise and worship as if you've been given that gift. So I want to make sure that this house is filled up with praise and worship this morning. Can we do that this morning? Amen. Go ahead and step on our feet and let's worship some more.
God, thank you so much for how you love us. Thank you for what you've done for us. Thank you that you run after us. You pursue us. And you don't want us to live in our sin or regret or any of that anymore. You have made us free. God, we just praise you and just ask that we live in that today and every day and that others will be drawn to the love that we have in you. In the name of Jesus, amen. So if you're in junior high or high school, please go over to our student center for a service. And the rest of you, just greet one another. Good morning, everyone. Hey, welcome to our service. Those online, I can't see you, but welcome. I'm glad you've chosen to spend an hour or so with us. Hope you've already had the opportunity to indeed worship God and connect to him. Last week, you may not have noticed because of the excitement surrounding all the 67 baptisms we had, the three services, but we started a new series called the Red Letter Stories. And for those of you young enough not to know what that means, uh, there were a day back when when we would buy Bibles that had, were called red letter editions because the words of Jesus in the Gospels were in red letters. And so those were like highlighted as extra important. And so this is a series out of the Gospels of eyewitness accounts of Jesus' encounters. And you know, when you look at the four Gospels, that reflect the ministry of Jesus, an interesting, interesting collection of personal stories, Jesus stories, that for the most part cover the three years of his public ministry. It's interesting why the Holy Spirit chose to include certain stories that we have and not include other stories that are unknown to us, because obviously this is not a comprehensive list of everything that Jesus did in that time. But these have all been, by the Holy Spirit, included for a specific reason. In fact, the Apostle John, in the end of his gospel, said they all have one purpose for the reader. In John chapter 20, he says, Therefore, many other signs, miracles and things, Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may believe two things. One, that the human Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. He's the Messiah, the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. And two, he's more than a man. He is the Son of God. He is divine. And that by believing these things of who he is and what he's done, the reader, you and I, may have life, eternal life in his name. So if you're familiar with the Gospel of John then you probably already know that John built his book, his gospel, around seven signs, seven miracles. Each one pointing to one thing, Jesus is the Son of God. Each one, from a human perspective, perhaps uh, showing more and more divine power. From John 2, where he turned water into wine, to the last one in John 11 that Brian handled last week, raising Lazarus from the dead after being in the grave for four days. So it's built around those seven, which is the number of God, seven miracles. But the other three Gospels, called the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, they're different. Uh, They're similar storyline, but they're different, which is in one sense understandable. Matthew was, of course, the converted tax collector who was an eyewitness, but Mark wasn't. He wasn't around. And people believe that he really got his material from Peter. So like the gospel of Mark is really the gospel of Peter. But then Luke, he wasn't around for any of that. He came 20 years later with um, Paul. And he said he researched. He talked to the apostles. He talked to the witnesses, people who had been there. And he wrote his gospel. So the question that comes to mind, and maybe you've thought of it, is what 
would you choose, what would you remember from three years of Jesus' experiences if you're one of the disciples? I mean, what would you, what would you remember? What would you, if you were Peter, choose to tell Mark or some of the other apostles, what would you choose to tell Luke? Like, tell me about Jesus. I'm, I'm writing a book. With so many miracles happening, wouldn't they become kind of commonplace? I mean, wouldn't one miracle kind of run into the other? I mean, every day there's things happening all day long. And so I think apart from the Holy Spirit, obviously, which was a determinative factor, I think humanly speaking, the determinative factor would be what was most personally traumatic or emotional for you as a person? Just like us, what do we remember? We remember the things where we were our happiest moments, our saddest moments, our scariest moments, our angry moments. We remember those highly emotional moments in our lives past. And I think, given that human factor, that it's significant that here this morning we're going to consider a story that is in all three of the other Gospels. This encounter that we're going to look at was remembered by all the disciples who told these stories and remember these eyewitness accounts of the day that the Savior confronts a satanic streaker. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with that word streaker, who might be young enough, it happened way back when, it happens once in a while, here's the definition. A person who runs naked through a public place. Usually you'd see it at an athletic, like football halftime. Some guy would have a sack over his head and running through the crowd. But it also happened in other places, um, either to attract attention to yourself or to express a strong disapproval. So sometimes people do that in the day for political reasons, like we're protesting something. But our original speaker was doing neither one. He was not seeking attention, nor was he showing disapproval of anything. We see rather this individual who is satanically controlled. And though this story happens and is recorded in all three synaptic gospels, we're going to follow Mark chapter 5 account. If you have a Bible, you want to turn there. We're going to be in Mark 5, 1 and 20, which is actually surrounded by miracles before and after that. And actually, Ed's going to handle one of the later ones in a couple of weeks. But in order to look at this miracle of what happened with this guy, we need to go back a chapter to chapter 4 of Mark. Let's say that this chapter, let's say you're all part of the gang on that day, and you are with Jesus. It's, let's call it a Monday. We're there, and Jesus in Mark chapter 4 heals all day long. He's healing all these people. At the end of the day, and, and he's doing this, by the way, on sort of the southwest edge of the Sea of Galilee. At the end of the day, he says to you and the rest of the disciples, hey, I want to go across the shore to the other side, so let's, let's go, let's row. So there you are at the end of the Sea of Galilee. If you're unfamiliar with that lake or its size, if you've ever been to Tahoe, Lake Tahoe for a vacation or a pyramid lake north of Reno for fishing, both of those lakes are in similar size and shape as the Sea of Galilee. They're longer than they are wide. They run north and south. And particularly the Sea of Galilee, as in Pyramid Lake and others, they're very susceptible to wind coming out of the north, the storms. So you're going to be in this boat. You're, you're rowing from west to east to go over there. And those storms would come down from Mount Hermon, that little mountain range there, run down across the full length of the lake, down the, the Jordan River Valley, into the Dead Sea, which is below sea level. So imagine, those winds are coming. They're picking up speed all the way through. Which means if you're rowing in your little boat, those waves are coming, maybe three-foot white-capped waves hitting you broadside. So they're out there in the middle of the night fighting it. They're tired. They're scared to death. They wake up Jesus, remember, and say, Lord, we're going to die out here. Don't you care? He's in the stern. He's kind of away from the waves. He's obviously very tired to still sleep with through that wakes up, looks around, says, hush, be still. And the wind stops, the waves go perfectly still, and these guys have their lives saved, but are further traumatized in their minds and hearts. End of chapter 4. He said to them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? I mean, guys, you've been with me, you've been seeing this stuff, come on. 
and they became very much afraid. This is what was told Mark. We thought we were scared in the storm till after the storm was over, and then we were terrified. Why? They said to one another, who then is this guy that even the wind and the sea obey him? You know what happened? I'll tell you. These guys touched the edge of the supernatural. It was around them. They touched the edge, and it terrified them. And so now, still very tired, deeply troubled by this traumatic event, and still trembling, they rowed to the nearest shoreline. Verse 1. They came to the other side of the sea into the country of the Gezerines. Let me show you a little map of this just so we know where we're at. If you see there at the south edge, southeast edge of the Sea of Galilee, that's about where this thing happened, what we're going to read now. And he calls it the Gezerines. You see that down there? That must have been a major city. Uh, Matthew calls it the land of Gadarens. So that's, you see the Gadara, that's south, southeast six miles from where they were. Verse 2. When Jesus got out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. Folks, if this had been a horror movie, it could not have been scripted better, really. I mean, it, it's almost funny. Jesus, th th these guys unknowingly, having had all the trauma they've just experienced, they, they unknowingly rowed their boat into a spooky cemetery <laughs> to cook breakfast and eat breakfast, to, to, to have a meal, get their legs stretched. And Jesus, in the bow now of the boat, he, he barely climbs out when this naked maniac runs out of the nearby cave, a tomb, at them, screaming at them. And if it hadn't happened so quickly and so unexpectedly, you can imagine that these guys would have been reverse rowing. I mean, they would have said, retreat, retreat. Jesus, get back in the boat. We're out of here. But they didn't have the time. It was so, it was so unexpected that they didn't have time to react or row. So what we get to see, what we get to observe, is to witness three different responses to encounters with supernatural Jesus, starting with Satan's response to Jesus as we learn about the depth of demonic darkness, verse 3. And he, the demonic, had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one was able to bind him anymore. Key point, circle that one anymore, even with a chain, because he had often been bound with shackles on his ankles and chains on his wrists, and the chains had been torn apart by him and the shackles broken in pieces, and no one was strong enough to subdue him. This guy was like superhuman. Constantly, day and night, he was screaming, screeching amongst the tombs and in the mountains and gassing himself with stones. So as you see this picture, it's easy to understand why they all remember this story and this guy. This naked guy, out of his mind, comes running at them. His entire body is covered with scars. And he's in their face. He's nose to nose with these guys. And he has all these scars along with all the cuts, bleeding and various stages of healing, all from self-inflicted cuts that he probably did with the sharp flint stones that we found along the cliffs of the cave. And every waking moment, he's facing the horror of thousands of inner voices screeching at him, telling him satanic dark things, telling him he's a nobody, nobody loves you, you have no hope, you deserve to be punished, cut yourself, you can't escape us, we own you, uh, put yourself out of misery, kill yourself. I mean... He can't sleep. Sometimes he just falls down exhausted, but then the voices start up and he gets up again. So he has no rest for his mind or body. He's acting out his, his frustration, his, his agony and anger and aggression to the people who unsuspectingly walk by. And we're not told how this happened to him. And certainly we can't relate to his level of despair. Jesus and John said the devil comes to deceive and destroy in the Western world in which we live, uh, as close as we get to seeing anything like this is in some sort of R-rated occult horror movie. 
Of course, why someone would go to that, I don't know, but I know there's a human fascination with the forbidden, and so people, both religious and irreligious, like, ooh, I'm going to go be scared. But in the ancient world, it was not entertainment. And God specifically warned his people about, actually forbid them, about freely open themselves up to the spiritual gateways that lead to the world of satanic darkness. He forbid it. I remember um, shortly after I became a Christian, 55 years ago, uh, got involved in the church there in my hometown, got involved doing all these different things, teaching and so forth. And a couple of years after I started going, my wife and I, there was these two young women who came to church, Anita and Sandy. Once in a while they brought Anita's husband, Max, with him, who was Sandy's brother. They lived in a trailer court there at the end of Soul Lake Road on the Reno Highway. And uh, all those old trailers back in those days were like 8x40s or 10x50s size-wise. And um, they came and they immediately, almost immediately became Christians and became part of the fellowship. And I was teaching and doing different things, so I started kind of interacting with them. And one day I just asked them, I said, so tell me, you know, tell me your story. How is it that you, you know, came to Grace, or not Grace, First Baptist, and, and became believers and so forth? And I remember they kind of looked at each other sheepishly. And then Anita said, well, you know, um, a few months back, actually several months back, we got fascinated with a Ouija board. My grandmother, religious Catholic grandmother, told me to not mess with it and don't do that and blah, 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 blah. But, you know, we, we didn't really listen to her. So we got this, and if you're not familiar with it, it's just a, it's kind of a game board that has these letters on it, and you have this wheel kind of thing, and you ask it questions, and you move the wheel, and it's all supposed to be, you know, touching the spiritual and spooky and ooh, cool. And, and so we did that, and we started asking the questions. And after a while, she said, it, it sort of took on a mind of its own. We'd ask it questions, and it would give us answers. And so pretty soon, we just left it there on our little kitchenette room, our dining room table there in our little trailer kitchen. And we just kind of ate around it, and we'd come home from work, and we'd play it, and blah, 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 blah. And, and so we thought that was pretty cool. Until one morning, Anita said, I got up to make some coffee, and I, I got the milk out of the, fri out of the refrigerator. I went to get the milk, and either she slipped and it fell out of her hand, or the milk fell out of the, out of the, ridge, the door. She, you know, she opened it quick, and, and she couldn't catch it. And it spilled all over the floor. She said that... When that happened, her, she's an unsafe person, she just said, I, you know, I just, I just blurted out Jesus' name in anger. Jesus Christ. You know how people are doing they're unsaved? She said, when that happened, the little wheel on the Ouija board flew straight up, hit the ceiling, and fell on the floor. And she was terrified. She took what she did, what her grandmother told her to do all the time. She took everything about it, boxes, the whole thing, took it out to the trailer park, dumped, and dumped it all in there, told Sandy about it later, and the next Sunday they both came to church and soon came to Christians. Somehow this guy in Mark 5 had freely opened that gateway because God forbids Satan from taking over humans against their will with this level of demonic possession and control. In fact, Jude says that those demons who violated that first state, that domain, were taken out of the way and thrown into the abyss, bottomless pit. And he says they're imprisoned there in chains of darkness, whatever that means. Early on, this guy was physically controllable. But as he gave himself more and more to the darkness, it became worse, and he became worse. Thinking he was gaining special power, no doubt, he lost everything. His marriage, his family, his friends, his home, all contact with people, peace of mind, everything of value. Until finally he lost his very life. The demonic are now speaking through his tongue and moving his body like a puppet, and he's totally powerless. But unexpectedly, Jesus one morning shows up at the cemetery, and as his disciples had just experienced the night before, Jesus is 
supernatural power personified. And when any creature touches the edge of the supernatural, there's only one possible outcome, and that's recognition of his power. Recognition of his power. There are no atheists within Satan's angelic army. Verse 6. Seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed down before him, and shouting with a loud voice, he said, What business do we have with each other, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God, do not torment me. For he, Jesus, had been saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And he, Jesus was asking him, What is your name? And he has the most interesting answer. He said, my name is Legion, for we are many. In both Old Testament and New, especially in Paul's writings, we know that Satan's army has an authority structure, much like a military of some sort. Apparently, the voice that's speaking is in charge of up to 6,000 of these demonic beings inside this guy, because he calls himself Legion, which is the the category of a Roman legion with 6,000 soldiers. So you can imagine the disciples still reeling from the storm and what happened the night before, taking all this in that close to the guy. I mean, the guy is there, Jesus is there, and they're here in the boat like, whoa! It's burning into the recesses of their minds so they'll never forget this. In fact, Matthew has this, Matthew 9, Matthew 8. And they cried out, saying, What business do we have with each other, Son of God? Have you come to here to torment us before the time? You understand? They're not questioning Jesus' divine authority over them. They're not questioning their ultimate condemnation of judgment. They're just questioning God's timing, which I think is amazing. I mean, if you knew you were going to be condemned... And you're talking to the judge, wouldn't you ask for relief? But such is the nature of spiritual darkness once it controls you. Legion is just as controlled by Satan to do Satan's will as this demonic man was controlled by Legion to do Legion's will. Helpless, hopeless creatures of wrath. Verse 10. And he began to implore Jesus earnestly not to send them out of the country. So the second response is to run from his presence, which is why we're told in the scriptures that if we resist Satan, he has to flee from us. He has to flee from the Lord Jesus. But realize the demons are not asking to be sent to some other neighboring country. Like, can you send us north to Damascus? Oh, don't send us to Phoenicia. We don't like that. No, no, no. Luke says it this way. They were imploring him, Jesus, not to command them, because if he did, then they're done, not to command them to go away into the abyss where they knew their kindred spirits had been locked for thousands of years. Luke says they're terrified Jesus is going to change up God's timing of their judgment. Verse 11, now there was a large herd of swine feeding nearby on the mountain. The demons implored him, saying, Send us into the swine so that we may enter them. And Jesus gave them permission. And coming out, the unclean spirits entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank, a cliff basically fell off, into the sea, about 2,000 of them, and they were drowned in the sea. Now some have questioned why Jesus allowed the demons to destroy the property of other people. And some of the answers along the way have been, well, they were probably owned by Jewish you know, outlaws. They weren't supposed to keep swine, they're unclean animal, blah, blah, blah. And all those answers, I, I don't think, really answer the issue. I, I think the best answer is tied to delivering man's welfare. And it's simply this. Jesus calling upon unseen spirits to leave this guy, uh, that would be invisible. How would you know they're gone or not gone? But... The sight of these frenzied Sampita swine, as heard, you know, falling to their destruction, would have been an unforgivable demonstration, one, of the fearful strength of evil, and two, 
physical evidence of the spiritual reality of the scope of his deliverance. This guy would never be tempted again to invite darkness into his life. And so what happened finally to that legion of demons is not mentioned. I mean, we think about maybe their escape from Jesus ended badly. What if they were restricted by Jesus' command to actually remain with those dead pig harvests all this time? We don't know. What's included next in our story is the society's response to Jesus. And as you can imagine, the herders who were watching this Jesus encounter from up above on a cliff, maybe 1,500 yards away, they are disturbed by their touch with the supernatural. It says their herdsmen, verse 14, ran away and reported it in the city and in the country. So you have to picture this poor group of herdsmen. I mean, there they are minding their own business, right? taking care of 2,000 pigs. And there's still some of them still groggy from the night duty. They had guard duty. They're still kind of trying to gather themselves. Some of the other guys have started a little fire there for their own breakfast, and they're sitting there watching as the pigs, you know, start to wake up, a little grunt here and a grunt there, and, you know, get up, look for some grass to eat, whatever. And then one of them by the fire notices a boat, Jesus and his disciples rowing in. He says to the guys, hey, 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 guys, look at this, look at this. Those dummies, they don't even know where they're going. They're going right to that crazy guy's cave. Oh, this is going to be good. This is gonna, watch this. And they all start watching. It's like, yeah, this is going to be crazy. And they watch with keen interest. Sure enough, the maniac runs out of his cave yelling and screaming at Jesus. And if you've ever been camping, like, by a lake, like Almond or somewhere in the early morning, you know, the sound bounces. You can hear a conversation from a long ways off. These guys are close enough. As the sound bounces off that early morning water's edge, they hear both legion screaming and Jesus comments to him. And they're sitting there watching and listening to this thing, and then suddenly, without any warning at all, their world, their lives literally explode all around them. I mean, they can do nothing to stop these 2,000 pigs from running off the cliff after each other to their deaths. I mean, it's all over in less than a minute. I mean, one moment, they're watching what they thought would be the manic, the, the maniac, you know, scaring off yet another group or individual of unsuspecting visitors and have a good, oh, that's so good, look at that guy. That guy was so scared, he ran like crazy. And the next moment, their hearts are gripped by panic and fear as the herd starts making these unearthly screeching and noise and squeals and runs by them right off the cliff. And, and they, they creep up to the cliff, look over the edge, see the last of them struggling and bodies floating all over the place, and they run for it. They take off. They know they're in big, big trouble. Why? Because this is like a, com a community herd. It's like it's city-owned. They all have ownership. And so they run for Gadara, six miles away, southeast uh, from the coastlines, and they're, they're telling everybody they meet, who may be more Gadarians coming out to check the herd. But who's going to believe that kind of wild, crazy story, right? Nobody. Wait a minute. Who did what? Wait. Were you guys drunk sleeping when someone stole of our pigs? No, no, no. We, we're not responsible for our fault. You've got to come and check this out. One common concern everybody they talked to would have, our pigs are gone. Who's going to pay for this? Who's paying for this? Are you pay What's going on? Verse 14. And the people came to see what it was that had happened, no doubt. They came to Jesus and observed the man who had been demon-possessed sitting down, clothed in his right mind, the very man who had the legion. And they became frightened. You read a story like this, it's easy to overlook the logistical, natural or logistics of the event and not realize that this, while we read it in just a few verses, this was an all-day event. I mean, this wasn't just in and out kind of a deal. How long does it take the herders to run six miles back to Gadara, stopping to tell everybody along the way their story, and then get to town, tell all the town pig owners the story, gather them up, 
and then have them all walk back six miles to the coast to see what's going down. I mean, this was not a 20-minute turnaround. This was uh, an all-day affair. Jesus and his disciples spent hours with this man. I mean, hours, all day probably, finding out his real name, hearing his story. So you're married? Okay, where you, where'd you, what, what, how'd you, you know, asking him questions. Obviously, they had breakfast. Uh, they got him some clothes. You could hear Jesus. Hey, James, don't you have another coat in the boat? Yeah, it's all, that's all right. Bring it. Let's get some clothes in this guy. I mean, the whole thing. Jesus explaining who he is, what this guy needs to believe, why he's come, how it is that he, a Jew, is helping him, a Gentile. Folks, this would have been the most amazing, one of the most amazing days of their entire lives. It's no wonder they all remember the story 30 years later and tell Mark, and tell Luke about it. But what is the response of the owners? I'll tell you, it's resentment. It's resentment of his power. See, this demonic, in all likelihood, was one of their own. They may have all known him from his past. Uh, They may have been the ones who put the chains on him. They see him totally healed, Back to normal, exactly and completely opposite of what he was before. Now he's sitting at peace. He's resting. Instead of running around in agony and screeching, he's clothed. A sense of decency has been restored to him. Instead of when they were trying to put chains on him, naked with no sense of shame, just spitting at him and screaming at him and all the stuff that would have happened. And most of all, he's in his right mind. In other words, his sanity is returned. His his self-awareness has been restored. He has his memory back. As they came, he could have called them by name, and and they called him by first name. And are they relieved? Are they happy for his healing? Are they rejoicing for the family and the reunion that's going to come? No. It says they became frightened. Of what? The danger has been removed. The demons are gone. They were frightened about more financial loss if Jesus Christ stayed around and used his power. They resented Jesus and his use of the power to heal because all they saw was a total loss of their profit and the person setting before them who was responsible for it. So they first responded with resentment and second was the rejection of his person, his presence. They all wanted one thing and one thing only. Will you leave right now? Verse 16. Those who had seen it described to them how it happened to the demon-possessed man and all about the swine. And immediately they began to implore him, Jesus, to leave their region. Isn't this incredible? Here's a group of people... Society, representing the world at large, probably you're religious, doing their thing, businessmen doing their life, da, da, da. And they come and they saw enough physical evidence with their own eyes to actually believe in the supernatural power of Jesus Christ. And they resent it, touching their lives, and thus reject the presence of the person who possesses it. Such is the power of darkness. Such is the power of unbelief. And yet, it's happened just that way for 2,000 years, and it continues to happen. This very same thing still happens all the time right now. You say, it does? Yeah. Yeah. It happens in marriages between husbands and wives. It happens in families between parents and children and siblings. It happens in friendships between lifelong childhood friends. It happens in the workplace. It happens. It happens when Jesus delivers someone from Satan to salvation. And the people in their lives resent the changes and reject Jesus' presence. I don't want to hear about Jesus anymore. I don't want you talking to me or our kids about Jesus. 
I don't want to go to church with you. I don't want you going to church. I don't want to see a Bible. I don't want to read your Bible. I don't want your friends hanging around here. I want it just like it was before you had your Jesus encounter. And no doubt, some of you have experienced or are experiencing that very thing. But the thing is, you can't go back like it was before, because that can never be. Let's consider the saved's response to Jesus. When the creature truly, truly is touched by the edge of supernatural love, there can only be one outcome. You are first released by his power. You're released. The Bible says we become new creations. We become new creatures in Christ. Uh, the old is gone. The new has come. When you trust in Jesus as your Savior and Lord, like the man in our story, our entire life paradigm radically changes. Everything is different. Um, the crowd saw the outward result only. They saw this man, observed him, demon-possessed, sitting down, clothed the right mind. He looked normal, but he hadn't been normal. But what he and we experience is an inward peace of mind that for many of us we never understood before until we received Jesus. We receive a soul rest. We don't have to be struggling in turmoil. We can just rest in Christ because we have been clothed in Jesus' righteousness. No longer naked in sin before God, we are clothed in his righteousness, and because of that, we gain a right mind for the first time in our life. Paul says in Corinthians 2, we gain the mind of Christ. And the more we experience it, the more we do not want this new life to be lost to us or in any way leave it. So like the guy, verse 18 as Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed was imploring, begging, asking him that he might accompany him. So from being released by his power, we now request his presence. And here's where our story takes this most interesting twist, really, because three requests were made of Jesus in our story, from Satan, from society, and from the saved man. And interestingly enough, Jesus granted the first two requests. He permitted the demons to go. He got into the boat. But he refused the third request, the very one we would expect it a yes to. Well, sure, you can join my God. There's always room in the boat. Come on in. Verse 19. And Jesus did not let him. But he said to him, go home to your people. And report to them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim to Capitalists what great things Jesus had done for him, and everyone was amazed. So let me just give you a quick word of background. Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, is fulfilling the Father's mission. As Jesus said, I've been called to go only to the lost house of Israel. That was his first trip mission. I'm not responsible for the world yet, for the Gentile region of Decapolis. Let me show you that map again. See, there is this area established from, from Damascus in the north down to Philadelphia at the bottom, 10 cities that Pompey established in 63 BC as a Roman district. Now, that well, used to be the Manasseh. That used to be the tribe of Manasseh when Joshua came, but no longer. And it was governed by Rome. And Jesus, instead of making, uh, okay, we're just going to go out into that area and we'll just do some. No, no, no. He just got to the edge of it, then went back into his area of Samaria and Galilee and Judea and so forth. But he instead makes a statement that missions begin at home by sending this delivered man home as the very first Gentile missionary to go show and tell. As we just read, this guy did that with great impact. But see, as we come to the end of his story, it's not the end of our story. It's just really the start. So let me talk to you just for a moment about 2024 and the year that we're in. Here's the question I have for you. When we, what will we do when we 
encounter the power and the presence of Jesus Christ. When we encounter it and him the year ahead, you say, what do you mean? When you and I touch the edge of the supernatural, will we recognize the Holy Spirit's conviction of sin? Will we submit and follow his direction? Or, like the demonic, will we just try to run away from it, even if it means living with the pigs, like the prodigal son did? What will we choose? When we uh, feel that presence in person in the lives of those close to us, like the people, the city people there, Gadarians, will we resent them and reject Jesus as not for me? Will our goal be, hey, I just want to keep my status quo intact. I'm not changing for God. Or... Will we allow God to do his mission of salvation and sanctification in our lives and in their lives? You see, seeking a release from Satan should be our first hope. There's an area of my life I've been struggling with. Will we seek that in our lives? Will we request the Savior, allow us to walk with him daily? In those places of divine encounter, there's going to be three influences. Satan's societies, and the Savior. And when you and I encounter it, we're going to make a choice. I believe the Holy Spirit will tell us what our next step is when that happens, what it should be. My prayer for all of us this morning is that we will all hear that Spirit of God telling us and will heed his word and follow his lead. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you this morning for this story and for these opportunities we see with people and how they responded to your supernatural person. Lord, we know that moment for many of us that we came in to touch that supernatural person. The Spirit of God brought us to salvation, and we were changed just like this man was changed, outwardly and inwardly. Father, we don't want to leave that behind. We want to walk in the spirit of that all the days of our life until faith becomes sight. And so, Father, I pray you'll lead us, make us vulnerable to your spirit, help us to be encouraging to those who have that same kind of life-changing conversion and help them in their journey and encourage them. And help us, Father, to be those missionaries that you want us to be to our own people as we live out each day of our life for your glory and for your king. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So some of you came this morning not knowing that you had a divine appointment, but you may have one now as you listen to this message saying, you know, I think I need to pray about some of this stuff, maybe to seek God, maybe to rejoice with God. There's a prayer team will be up here shortly, and they'll be here to pray with you and keep that divine appointment, please, as you, before you leave and head for home. Next week, we're going to continue this red letter story. Brian will be back. I'm not going to tell you what passage, but I bet you can guess what that passage is about, but we'll be looking at that next week, and a great conversation Jesus had with someone at the water cooler. So guys, uh, every week we're told the same thing, go be the church, you are the church, go be the church, you now have it from Jesus' own mouth, go home (laughs) to your own people, whatever that means, and tell them how great God is and how loving and merciful he is to do it in all of our lives to rescue us from our worst nightmares. God bless you. We'll see you next week.
So long to share, walk through the sorrow, out of the fire, into tomorrow. So flush the fields, face the fear, feel the way, disappear, when